thank you very much for the invitation. But I'm now in a very difficult position. Professor Christoph said to you, he told you so much interesting and partly entertaining things about <laughs> English in a perfect English. <laughs> and I will tell you in my poor English much less entertaining things about <laughs> theories. Um, I am uh, conjured only by two things. First, you have been told to be tolerant to English. <laughs> <laughs> And second, uh, the, the whole part, the part of your uh, gathering is, is under the title theoretical training. So it will be real theoretical training. What I want to, to present to you is a view of, of uh, the social and political consequences of, um, of languages in Europe. In, in, uh, of the very particular uh, in, uh, history of forming of uh, European languages and nations, which probably shapes our present and will shape our future. Which means that in particular in Europe, we have to develop um, certain strategies which are not now new, as for example, multilingualism. But that is, this is the framework in which you are, exer you are exercising your making. <clears throat> Modern society, as you all know, uh, you know, um, as well as uh, democratic politics in, uh, in particular, are based on communication among citizens. It is a new, new development, new social and political development since, say, 200 years that uh, language is uh, playing a um, bigger and bigger role in organization of societies and in their governance. Uh, 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 modern societies are based on communication uh, among the citizens and between the governments and the citizens. As the German sociologist Niklas Luhmann put it, uh, society, I quote, society is the encompassing system of all communications in the environment of which there are no communications but only events of another kind. End quote. Uh, I mean, including violent ones. So language barriers are at the same time <coughs> encompassing societies. They are today more important than uh, political or geographical frontiers. And on the other hand, they create barriers to, to com communicate among the neighboring societies and uh, um, are places of a certain danger, of certain tensions, where people are unable to speak to each other. They, uh, they are limited in their communication to other, including physical means of, yes, communication. <clears throat> and, uh, yes, as we say communication, it means uh, at the same time language, because language is the most important bearer of uh, human communication. Uh, everybody knows that in Europe in, and in Central and Eastern Europe in particular, uh, uh, the, the country is, the, the, the area is divided by a wide variety of languages into linguistic groups whose members are not able to communicate with the others. Um, to our American students, we have always to bring the, the surprising news that if a Czech gets into a car in Prague and drives off in a random direction, within a few hours of driving, he will come into contact with people he will not understand. <clears throat> Even after the fall of, of the Iron Curtain and the removal of uh, border controls, uh, uh, he will still come across Niemcy, uh, which, is, which means in modern Czech, Germans, but um, literally the dumb people. Uh, as our ancestors uh, called all foreigners. <clears throat> 
In contrast to themselves, who designated themselves as slaves, Slovan, those who have the word, the, the, the others are dumb. Because instead of saying something reasonable, they utter um, incomprehensible sounds, phonations, would be, would, uh, modern linguists would say, without any sense. <clears throat> In a similar way, the Greeks called barbaroi, all those who looked like humans, but instead of pronouncing understandable words and phrases, uttered merely uh, wild sounds with no meaning at all. If men could have been defined as the animal with speech or reason by Aristotle, is a person with whom I cannot speak a human being at all? It was, uh, this, is, this is a big problem uh, all over the world. <clears throat> and uh, what is interesting about uh, Europe is the, the particular way how our ancestors dealt with it, uh, forming national languages and uh, national states. <clears throat> to the great surprise of most outside observers, different forms of nationalism uh, emerged in Eastern Europe and in the Balkans, immediately after the change of 1989. <clears throat> Some of them with disastrous, disastrous consequences. But to be able to efficiently oppose these rather primitive and sometimes aggressive movements requires a deeper understanding of the real social basis. Uh, of the soci socio-psychological reasons of some common human feelings so easily prone to nationalistic abuse. Among academics, there is a widespread conviction that nationalism is simply a form of atavism, a surviving vestige of tribal feelings or of the chauvinistic propaganda of the 19th century. This is perhaps true, but not a good po starting point to understand modern nationalisms, as it uh, prevents us from seeing and taking seriously some rather straightforward psychosocial factors. <clears throat> the current status of the English language in the world means that an English speaker is unlikely to experience this sort of linguistic alien alienation not being able to communicate in his own language and is therefore not fully in a position to assess the otherwise obvious meaning of language and of the linguistic community. Uh, linguistic diversity, as it is presented, for example, in Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, is a completely different thing, or linguistic difference, with, about which uh, Professor Christa spoke. This is a queer variety, of course, maybe surprising or unexpected, but nevertheless not hindering a basic communication, basic understanding. It doesn't uh, mean that you, uh, you could uh, doubt about the other person's humanity. <clears throat> the dangerous un tendency to underestimate the social significance of language is still common for another reason, too. It also ar arises from the positivist illusion that language is a mere instrument of communication, an interchangeable tool that allows humans to exchange information. Uh, it was not before the 20th century that linguists, philosophers, and anthropologists provided convincing evidence of things that some romantics had felt long before. Uh, communication is indeed the elementary or proximate function of language. But language is in fact much, much more. It is essentially the bearer of the general environment of meanings into which every human being is born and in which he or she becomes a grown up person a member of a society. It is through language that we received our particular culture in the broadest sense of the word, 
as it is handed down to us, it was handed down to us by parents and by the surrounding. Now we casually speak about teaching a language. Every child, in fact, constructs its first maternal language <laughs> as if from scratch and on its own by, by trial and error. A child is born without language, maybe with some linguistic competencies, as the Chomskyan theory says. This is highly probable, but nevertheless, a child has first to construct his language by uh, the, the, um, and the, um, the ability to, to the understanding that things can be represented by words is something which is um, a, a great uh, um, intellectual achievement of every newborn child. <clears throat> uh, so, um, uh, of course, we, are, we, were, um, we were significantly helped uh, by the adults around, but um, it is, um, it is um, every, every one of us had to construct his or her uh, own language uh, by trial and error in a, in a very authoritative way. We were never told why, why this is paper or this is microphone, we were told it is so. And if we spoke it differently, we were blamed or even beaten. So in this very authoritative way, we all learned our, lang our first language, this structure of meanings related to the outside, to the uh, surrounding reality. And um, this is, um, closely connected with our ability to, to, uh, to structure our experience into the experience of individual things. What I have in my, on my retina is, is, a, is a panorama of, of, um, uh, of spots of various colors out of which I construct, in opening my eyes, I construct the fact that there are chairs, there are persons, there are bags, and so on. <clears throat> and all this is, is done during the acquisition of the first maternal language. Uh, learning another language is always much simpler because it uses this prepared structure, this prepared knowledge that things can be designed by words, that things can be expressed and understood by the others, uh, which he, uh, he or she acquired with the maternal language. <clears throat> and so, the, uh, of course, we can uh, learn another language, we can change our um, first language maybe, in childhood, but um, anyhow, the, the importance of the first uh, ethologist would say imprinting of, of um, uh, our first language remains an important part of our identity. <clears throat> Under identity, I don't understand an immutable sameness, but rather a kind of permanent imprint of the first integration of the individual into his local immediate community, into its communication, and later into wider and wider society. Even if uh, we later uh, learn other languages, we remain, uh, we are always indebted to this first imprinting in which we, we, we started to understand the world around us uh, and uh, create our first categories, like the category of things, or category of persons, category of movements, of doings, of properties, and so on. <clears throat> I cannot um, examine in detail the, the extremely interesting individual birth and evolution of the Central European peoples and nations, the development of national and written languages, in parallel with the 
strengthening of their political organization during the Middle Ages. But the, the link between these two processes is obvious. <clears throat> Let me only mention a few examples of the role of Christianity in the emergence of this remarkable and typical European phenomenon of nation as deeply different from a tribe. Mm, the acceptance of Christendom first permitted the cultural and religious mm, uh, mm, barriers among the tribes to be overcome. The uh, tribal religions which were there before uh, mm, um, were linked, were, were um, uh, linked to the individual ancestors. The most, uh, most common uh, heathen religion which of our early ancestors was always um, uh, firmly bound to the family structure. And as my grandfather is not the grandfather of you, so we were, uh, people were permanently and, and durably uh, uh, bound to their tribal uh, roots and tribal origins. And they, these, uh, these, um, these, these divisions, these tribal and, and family uh, um, uh, links and, and uh, uh, have been, uh, could have been overcome only by uh, a different universalist religion. <coughs> uh, the, the other important thing in, this, uh, in these early origins of, of what we call modern Europe uh, consisted in uh, seeing the, uh, our own community in the earlier, uh, earlier st structures of societies, people divided the surrounding world um, among um, us and them. Uh, our, uh, uh, the, the closer community which uh, can communicate was, um, was um, in many languages is um, designed by the same name which designs humanity as at all. So it is in, the, in some northern North American tribal uh, local um, native languages, the, um, uh, the self-designation of the tribe means at the same time humans. And this is the case of famous case of the Inuit. And in, the, in Roma language, the word Roma, Roma means humans, human. Whereas the others, it's a question whether they are humans at all. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, this was uh, um, uh, farther uh, uh, the, uh, our ancestors uh, at the difference of this entered, were embedded into a larger community of Christendom and soon learned to distinguish the other na nations by their names or by their first ambassadors, namely the patron saints and their legends. Since the high middle ages, the church has ordered all children to, to, um, at baptism to be given their Christian names, names like Anne or Joseph, with no national marking, whereas the older uh, names were always had a meaning in own language, like Ratislav or Boleslav or, or um, Walpurgis or whatever, they, um, the Christian names were for a lion. They had no meaning in our own language. And so people were learned very early to understand that, that they are linked or maybe even anchored somewhere else outside of his or her national community. <coughs> Um, um, this is significant enough that this habit was kept up until the emergence of nationalism and the return of national first names in the early 19th century. <clears throat> but we have to limit our considerations here to a much narrower question, 
namely to examine more closely the political significance of language and its historical development in the modern era. In the older, traditional and hierarchically organized societies, power was not exerced directly by the ruler, but mediated <laughs> by court nobility and landed gentry, so that the ruler only needed to communicate with the aristocrats. For these reasons, traditional societies have had few problems with the diversity of languages and have often been uh, ruled successfully by kings or of foreign origin. This was usual up to the 15th century, say, generally. Uh, the political significance of language was intensified by the development of absolutism which gradually excluded the intermediary role of the nobility instead of the more or less independent noblemen, the rulers established paid local officials and clerks to collect taxes and un un undertake other regular duties, and eventually even national standing armies. It was the rulers officials, clerks, judges, sheriffs, and so on, who were to negotiate and speak directly to all the commoners. For these reasons, in the states of Western Europe that underwent centralization at an early stage, particularly in France, but also in England and Spain, society was homogenized in terms of language as early as the late Middle Ages, partly by violent means political and religious unification went hand in hand with linguistic unification, as occurred, for example, in the Albigensian Wars in France, in the English conquest and of Ireland and Wales, or in the Spanish Reconquista. <clears throat> when uh, the society's modus operandi became increasingly complex during the modern era, and due to the influence of the Enlightenment, European rulers attempted to restrict the use of force in their exercise of power and to get their own uh, way as far as possible through written orders and decrees. Needless to say, this also required universal literacy and was the motive for the establishment of obligatory public schools in most of uh, continental Europe. Central and Eastern Europe lagged behind and the development of absolutism did not begin, roughly speaking, before the 17th century. It was only in the 18th century that the Austrian emperors stated with astonishment that they would have to publish their laws and decrees in at least five different languages. Indeed, there are imperial, imperial texts of this period which were duly printed in five columns adjacent, adjacent in uh, those various languages. Would it not be easier and more efficient to facilitate communication with the citizens, that is to say, of, on the recipient's side, by teaching a single state language to everyone? In the 18th century, these nationalist views led to the introduction of compulsory uh, schooling in German and to all the aspects of what the Czech history textbook, textbooks still refer to as Germanization. <clears throat> in reality, this did um, not amount to a single sinister plan to annihilate the Czech language and nation, but only a somewhat superficial bureaucratic and rational, rationalistic measure, not dissimilar to what some allegedly cosmopolitan political and social thinkers today recommend as a good means of combating nationalism. Let us all communicate in a single common language. But which one? Almost always this means my own. <clears throat> Under the pressure of the official state language as an instrument and sign of national cohesion, 
the smaller linguistic communities in Eastern and Central Europe had the choice either to be reduced to politically ineffective minorities of nothing more than ethnographic interest, or else to establish separate nation states in their own right. The following national renaissance movements were then repeatedly corroborated and reinforced by the social changes that occurred during industrialization and the associated mobility of the 19th century. The mobility of the surplus of the rural population that sought work in the towns, the influence of literature, the unified school system and the newspapers, in other words, the transformations of societies into communication societies, as Nick Luhmann puts it, practically wiped out all local dialects and only further accelerated the process of linguistic homogenization. <clears throat> the intro introduction of democratic freedoms and general suffrage by necessity supposes the development of public opinion, discussions and election campaigns, and the emergence of electronic mass media and their method of direct communication only drove the linguistic requirements to extremes. In the age of mass democracy and mass media, politics is possible only through the direct influence of politicians upon the citizens and the electorate, in other words, through language. Anyone who regrets the decline of the Habsburg monarchy only has to imagine the poor old emperor on television. What could he have said to his subjects, his peoples, and how? Poor emperor. Even the pope now has to deliver his Easter blessing in some 50 languages in the hope that the, that the believers from the remaining 4,000 or what yes, linguistic communities around the world do not look at the television. <laughs> <clears throat> um, a modern democratic state can exist only on the basis of a more or less homogeneous linguistic community, which formulates the Rousseauian general will, usually in several slightly different forms as programs of political parties. To keep the democratic process of choice and majority running, it can ill afford to tolerate any fixed, irreconcilable and immovable loyalties that would cut straight through society, as the national bounds of language are. <clears throat> This does not mean in any way that all people would have to abandon their cultural characteristics, but they would have to master a language that is common to all of them, because otherwise they would be practically excluded as citizens from the common domain of political life via facti. The human need for closer relationships and clearly defined communities can be satisfied in this case only by means of voluntary associations and organizations based on a consensus and local communication, and thus, thus means of mutual linguistic comprehension. <clears throat> the trivial fact that public opinion can originate only in one language cannot, unfortunately, be completely compensated even by means of bilingualism or multilingualism. For even people who are able to communicate in several languages ultimately have to select a single linguistic community in which they would like to participate in democratic decision making. This is well demonstrated by the case of Belgium and also partly in a somewhat different way of Switzerland. Uh, to a uh, um, lesser or greater extent. The European Parliament elections provide another example, <clears throat> although there are also left-wing, right-wing and liberal 
coalitions in this case, elections and especially election campaigns are always organized at national <laughs> state level, not only by constitutional, but also for linguistic reasons. Even the citizens of Luxembourg, by far the champions of multilingualism in Europe, have to be addressed in their local language during election campaigns. Once I have been with students to Luxembourg and there was a referendum, some re sort of referendum there in preparation. And we were surprised that all over Luxembourg there were big uh, affiches with a single word, ne, which is in Czech, not. But we were surprised how what, what uh, it is evidently not in Czech. And then uh, only we discovered that there is, that it is um, uh, in Luxembourgian, a language most people don't know that it exists, but which is spoken by the local people at home and it is, has to be used in, in election campaigns. And in Luxembourgian, which is a dialect of, of um, uh, Middle German, uh, the negation is like in Czech, ne, modern German, nein. <clears throat> yeah. the, the army of translators in both Brussels and Strasbourg parliaments bears witness to the same. The result is that even a political unified Europe can only be thinkable as a Europe of nations. Obviously, the linguistic diversity means serious disadvantages and barriers for the future of Europe, if not actual dangers. I spoke about the dangerous role of language barriers where people are unable to communicate. <clears throat> it was probably this linguistic division was at, at least uh, partly a factor that uh, contributed to Europe becoming a trouble spot or on several occasions in the 20th century. The, the tension between French and Germans, actually between French and German speaking people, was one of the, of the factors of both, both uh, world wars. <coughs> Would it not be much easier if we could dispense with linguistic diversity for the sake of modernization and economic efficiency and agree upon a common working language? A trivial question stands in the way of this great temptation envisaged by rationalists back in the 18th century. Which language? It was precisely this sort of desire for unification that later gave rise to plans for domination, which led to the worst wars U Europe has ever experienced. The first major in at attempt at modernization of this kind were the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, it is well known that um, it roused and mobilized nationalist feelings in Germany and min, min, uh, many other countries, whereas the other attempt by Hitler needs no further comment. And from this bitter lesson, I think, Europeans know better than a hundred years ago that the diversity cannot be taken away and that no one should attempt to do so. But there are also positive reasons to retain linguistic diversity as an essential characteristic of Europe, albeit uh, less, somewhat less tangible than these, than these hard, uh, palpable hard hurdles. Historically, European nations greatly profited from this diversity of their neighbors and learned from those who talk a different language. Whatever we have and are able to do, we owe to, in large measure to our neighbors. We Czechs owe too much, so much to the Germans. The Germans are indebted to the French and the Italians. 
The French inherited much from the Romans, while the Romans learned a great deal from the Greeks. And the Greeks evolved to be indebted to the Phoenicians, Phoenicians and Egyptians. Precisely this habit of taking an interest in other people has made us what we are today. From Herodotus via the Crusaders, Marco Polo, Columbus, to the countless missionaries and explorers, it was the otherness of the faraway world which nourished the particular European mobility, both physical and cultural. Secondly, every European has to learn at an early stage, in contrast to those who live in the major empires, how little we can take, for, um, take our mother language for granted. During childhood, most Europeans learn the important lessons that while we say bread, other people mutter something completely different. And they also soon learn that this barrier can be overcome. As um, Umberto Eco wrote a few years ago, the language of Europe is translation. <laughs> this gives us an additional sense of distance, not only to the immediate uh, experience of the here and now, but also in the way in which we gain control of this world of daily experience. Professor Crystal mentioned something similar in learning the tolerance to dialects. Mm. This is a sort of distance which, which makes us mm, attentive to the difference between expression and the object. <clears throat> Thirdly, uh, thanks to this discovery, we had to learn that our language is not a natural phenomenon, but a component of our particular culture. The word culture stems from the Latin verb colere, to grow, to use, to care for, to rise, to care for. Our language, the main career of all the other cultural contents and traditions, as well as of the simplest piece of information, only continues to exist for as long as we look after it and take proper care for of it. The question of the evolutionary advantages of the cultural and linguistic diversity of humanity has recently attached the attention of neo-Darwinist anthropologists and sociobiologists. In their assumption, the general success of mankind in terms of evolution depends decisively on the ability to work together and communicate to show solidarity and to build up mutual trust. The computer models convincingly demonstrate the importance of trust and also enable its conditions to be analyzed. Nowadays, it is broadly recognized that the tendency of a group to limit its own size, for example, by setting itself apart linguistically is a sort of trust-building exercise. I believe that the high-risk and unique strategy of living with and from diversity has proved successful in Europe. Europe's contribution to everything that is of value in the world is out of proportion to its surface area, population or wealth. The same applies to the contributions of smaller communities within Europe, and especially of its minorities. For example, the contribution of the inhabitants of Alsace to French culture, or of the Jews or Silesians to German culture. It is as if people who had to live on a, bro bro on a frontier to hold out vis-a-vis -vis other people were also forced to learn from them and thus became particularly productive. Confronted with the impersonal forces of global markets and mobility, of the uni unified and unifying technology, 
humans may feel desperately weak and thus uh, re uh, react with a blind, sometimes violent protest. The more organized movements of ever returning xenophobia, collective selfishness and national interest present a permanent danger to the rapidly changing world. What we need is a new model of larger political organization, on the one hand more flexible than even federal states, and on the other more binding and efficient than are the United Nations. Despite all the justified and unjustified criticisms, European Union could become a starter of or nucleus of such an alternative for a peaceful, peaceful organization of human societies on a larger scale. The enormous task to develop a political body without a unified language requires, of course, many institutional changes. As more and more of the challenges of the actual world are global, from economy and finance, security and crime, up to the environment, European institutions will have to be continuously adapted to cope with them. But there is the other, perhaps less spectacular need to adapt our social habits and competencies, so to say, on the grassroots level too. Diversity, this is the lesson of the European past, can be productive and beneficial only if it is communicated. This was, I think, the, the, uh, the um, blunder of um, um, multiculturalism that it believed that diversity is valuable per se, by itself. But um, by itself, it's only dangerous. It's merely the communicated diversity which can be uh, proficient. <clears throat> the strategic, strategic advantage of the European diversity has been to made fruitful by a strategic effort to improve our communication skills. Multilingualism, an old habit in this part of the world, has to be renewed, reinforced and further developed. A few years ago, the European Commission published a document on learning on foreign languages, which deserves, I think, much more attention than it got up to now. Uh, according to its recommendation, English should be taught and learned as the lingua franca, everywhere, but as, well, another language of choice, preferably the language of a neighboring nation. The reasons are simple. On the one hand, there is the global layer of our lives, and on the other hand, there is the local one. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is between the neighbors that most of the conflicts emerge, and uh, 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 a strengthening <laughs> of Europe cannot be done from Brussels alone. Europe has to be patient, patiently shown down, shown together or stapled together, in particular on the, its junctures by the daily activities of its citizens. And this is the task of language teachers and language teaching. Thank you for our, your attention. <laughs>